In Ephesians chapter 1, I've been dealing with the issue of prayer and I'm looking at maybe two or three parts that we may just call the power of prayer. Because in the two prayers of Ephesians, and actually I've been studying the, the prayers of Paul, and I thought it would be essential to look at the prayers of Paul to see in an environment that is anointed or filled with the Holy Spirit what it is that we seriously need to pray about. There can be no relationship with God if there is no communication. And the communication literally and actually begins with him. He has to initiate the relationship. Quiet as it's kept, you are not the one who stimulated God to respond to you. It is God who has to initiate the relationship because if Romans chapter 1 is important to a theological matrix, then we were to reprobate to decide in and of ourselves to come to God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, many times the flesh doesn't like to hear that the spirit will acquiesce because the spirit understands that the things of God that relate to us begin with God none of us none of us I don't care how wonderful you think you are none of us initiates contact with God it is God who has to initiate the contact and faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word of the Lord. So you can't have faith unless you hear. And you can't hear unless he speaks. So the whole issue of revelation and the fact that you have a revelatory experience with God indicates that he has initiated the action. Because we move within the parameters of what God has initiated, then we find that there are certain needs that we have that are exposed. Because you cannot walk in the presence of God and he not expose weaknesses. In Ephesians chapter 1, look at about verse 15, pull it up on your machines and all the other rest of the stuff. Uh, it's an important dynamic and it's critical to grasp that it is God who initiates and it's God who declares let there be light even in my life and as he declares let there be light then once that light comes on it is going to expose weaknesses. Oh yes, oh yes. Uh, I tell my friends all the time, they say, well, uh, Bishop, we don't see you wearing, uh, you know, fancy clothes, zillow tie, brioni suits, and all of that kind of stuff. And I simply tell them I'm too flawed to be flashy. Because when the light comes on, it doesn't only come on on your good features. Uh, let me take the picture this way. This is my better side. <laughs> the light comes on, it exposes everything. And so there is absolutely no way to have a relationship with God and not talk to God about the darkness that is in each one of us. So as we deal with him, he exposes and those things stimulate us into repentance because of the conviction of the Holy Spirit 
And that moves us then into praying like, forgive me as I forgive others. It's critical and it's very important because I think that most of us have become frustrated because, as James says, we have prayed amiss. And I think it's important now when we consider the ecological systems, the geopolitical systems, what's going on in our country, that for those of us who are walking with God, for us to know seriously how to talk to God about ourselves. Uh, I feel all right here. Uh, I'm telling you that we are about to go through even more horrendous times. Oh yes, I know what the prophet told you, everything's going to be all right, but he didn't tell you when, did he? So if we go to, uh, to Ephesians, rather, first, uh, the chapter of Ephesians, and I'm going to pick up at verse 15. Wherefore also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And here's what he's praying. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance the saints and thirdly, what is the exceeding greatness of his promise, of his power rather, to us would who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named and not only in this world but also in that which is to come put all things under his feet gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all I have visited this before I think multiple times but he opens by saying something that causes some consideration. He says, I'm going to pray for some people, but I'm going to pray because I heard something about you. And what he heard was that they had faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. Now I don't know if you're giving any thought to how superlative that is. How wonderful that is. And when you look at the Greek and the construction of the Greek as it relates to faith in this context, he is not just talking about having faith to believe, to enter into salvation. But what he's talking about here is faith that governs the child of God's everyday life. Because you and I have to understand by now that if you are a child of God at all, the just shall live every day by faith. I give an example now, it's sort of tragic, but Elder Jackson and Sister Betty didn't think this morning when they awakened to head this way that they would have to move into another dimension of faith. Simply because circumstances changed that are out of their control. And immediately they're thrust into a situation that 
calls for a reservoir of relationship with God. Because when you're not operating within the parameters of faith, you ask questions like, why me? I don't know, have you ever been through something you didn't expect, didn't plan? Something that was not spawned out of ill behavior or bad attitude. And immediately something has come upon you that you had to draw from the well in order to be able to handle it. Now that was an extreme case, but every day there is something in your life that would either move you to reject God or move you to believe him more. And that's that everyday walk of faith. I have to have faith when God tells me no. I have to have faith when he says yes. And I have to have faith when he says not now. Now maybe somebody can give me another scenario. Uh, but all I see is no, yes, not now. But it takes faith to have any kind of communication with God. And what Paul is saying is, here we got a group of people that walk with him by faith every single day. Now, not only do they walk by faith in the grocery store, in the pharmacy, walk by faith when they get up in the morning, cleaning the house by faith, and talking to the neighbors by faith, and enjoying life by faith following him by faith but they have love unto all the saints I know some people in the church that don't like me And I asked the Lord to help me not to know who they are. Because I've got to move into another dimension of faith to pray for them that despitefully uses it. I think there's a lesson in that. I think that there's a conversation that we can have as to where prayer is directed. Because I would simply ask you on the second aspect of his accreditation, I would simply ask you, do you love all the saints. We got we we talking now. <laughs> Amen. I. Some people you got to get close to for discernment. <laughs> I want you to give some consideration to the fact that loving all the saints. There's some people in your family. You have problems with. Uh, I was married once before and my ex-wife, when I would seek to console or to make up, I would say, do you love me? She would say, I love everybody. <laughs> and 
And because I like to argue, I always had a retort in my pocket. And I'd say, but you don't know everybody. And I've since learned that maybe God has kept some people out of our space because of the struggle we would have with loving them. Now you're looking at me like Alice in Wonderland, but I would like to ask you, have you begun to love your ex-husband yet? And are you back loving your ex-wife? Have you somehow found some love for your baby mama? Don't play with me now. <laughs> and you raise that child from birth. And the child is now 22 and you don't want nothing to do with it. Don't sit here and act because you're in church. Like it's easy to love everybody. There are some saints you won't get in their car. And there are some saints you won't invite to your house. Now you might act like it's because you're so holy that they can't come. But if you that holy and they that shabby, then it seems like you ought to get close to them in order to get them saved. Your enemy wouldn't be your enemy anymore if you got him saved. There is nothing more demanding and nothing more difficult for the child of God than to love everybody. You can't love people and have malice. You can't love people and can't see them coming, hate to see them coming. You can't love people and can't stand them. And the truth is, so the, so the conversation we're having here is a conversation that speaks to us as to who we ought to pray for. Give it some thought with me, and I don't think I'm dyslectic. Our proclivity, our tendency, maybe I need a stronger word, our predilection is to pray for folk who are wicked. Especially in our family. Especially if we got to deal with them. Our tendency is to pray for folk who are weak. Folk who are broken. And generally we call for prayer when we're going through something. That's the tendency. But it seems as if Paul is contradistinctive to the natural or the normal way that we would pray. For he has decided not to pray for anybody weak in the Ephesian church. He's decided to pray for some folk who are obviously very strong. They have faith in the Lord Jesus and they have love towards all the saints. My first reaction would B, why would I be praying for somebody who has already achieved the spiritual platitude of being able to love folk I can't stand? Why am I praying for? It would seem like they have already arrived. What he's showing me is that maybe we have left off praying 
for the people who have the most potential to be powerhouses with God. Maybe I'm seeing this by myself. You seen this with me? Maybe we have ignored praying for the child who is anointed. And we prayed for the child who's disobedient. We prayed for the child who's in the game, but we're not praying for the one that's not in the game. We're praying for the individual that's broke, but we're not praying for the one that's got some money. What he's showing me is maybe you ought to put your sight on folk who God has his hand on. Because when God puts his hand on somebody, they immediately become a target. The devil does not want a child that he already has. He wants the child that is walking away from him. The devil don't want a household that is already messed up. He wants a household that's already together. The devil wants to break up what God loves. I wish you'd understand me. And if God loves it, I ought to pray that it stays the way God wants it to be. I'm going to try not to hoop. Why don't you pray for me when I'm blessed? Instead of hating. Why don't you roll over in the morning and and say, Lord, keep him on the level he's on. And don't don't let him go lower, but let him go higher. Lord, give him more so he can bless more. Keep him healthy so he can go more, so he can touch more. Keep his mind alert so he can move in the hearts of people more. Do more, more, more. Don't make him any less. You got to pray for folk who God has his hand on. Devil want to kill that child, kill that preacher, kill that missionary, kill that worker, kill that... The devil's in the killing business. It's a critical thing then. Because he's showing me now that I need to pray for folk who are qualified for the next level. Oh yes. I discovered something in my life I discovered that the good doctors keep going to conferences the people have good marriages keep going to the marriage conferences you you know what I mean the people everything is tore up they ain't going to nothing (laughs) and they need to be there more than anybody else the good, great basketball players keep going to the special sessions. The good football players keep watching the film. There is something about when God has his hand on you that it stirs the enemy up. It makes him mad. And it causes him to bring people who have an influence in your life. Everybody don't bother you. Except you all have extended uh, that in Jamaica we call it botheration. You have extended to people who don't know you the opportunity to judge you. That's the social media. That's what that did. You just open the door to hear some junk from people who don't mean anything to you. But then you made them mean something to you when you started responding to them. You already had enough mess around you. Now you've extended the parameters of the mess all the way to South Africa. 
people answering you from Ethiopia. As if you didn't have enough to deal with from Ethiopia Street. He says, I pray for you and I cease not to make mention of you in my prayers. Because there is something that I need you to have. And that is that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in him. I want you to notice, first of all, that you will find in his prayers that he's never asking for material things. Ooh, I tell you this. He's never asking God for a Cadillac, a Rolls Royce, a bigger house, nothing. Because he is very, very familiar with Jesus' prayers. And with Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. And there's one thing that I think every man in this house who takes care of a family ought to understand. You know you got five kids now. And they're eating like they <laughs> heavyweight boxers. I don't know in your family, growing up in my family, there was six of us, seven of us really. And they had four boys, three girls. My brother Max, when my dad would bring the ham steaks, he wanted them. Eat a whole ham steak by himself. Want to eat a dozen eggs. The biggest fight in my house was over food. Eating like crazy. Now, you know you got to pay the electric bill, the light bill. The, you know you got to buy groceries. Now, why would you, as the head of that house, the provider, wait until your wife has to ask you for money for everything you know you got to take care of. It's like she got to approach your throne. Carefully, wondering what kind of mood you're in. Hoping to catch you at the right moment. Baby, can we have $150 for groceries? Now, you know what your household needs. You wake up every day looking for something to eat up in there. Come sometime, bust the door open, 2 a.m. in the morning. Uh, baby, I'm hungry. Wipes the sleep out of her eye. And go get whatever is in the cupboard. You know you're going to need groceries. So why you got them begging you for something you know is going to be needed? Now to anybody in here, that kind of behavior is hard. But we act that way towards God. We treat him as if he is a husband, 
a father who does not know how to take care of his house. I wish somebody would understand me. Jesus said, don't insult me. Because I know what you have need of. Before you ask. And you keep running up in here asking me for something that I've already provided. Don't insult me. As if I don't take care. I got news for you. Most of us already been taken care of. We just acted stupid with what God gave us. I know what you have need of. Since he said that, look, 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 look. If you don't think I'm right, take a look at Solomon. Solomon comes down here dressed in all of his clothes. And he don't look no better than one of the lilies of the field who comes up today and is gone tomorrow. If I can take care of a bird that's flying in the sky and take care of a lily that's about to die, then don't you think I can take care of you? I need you to pray for something else. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I'll take care of the rest of it. I feel like shouting in here. I feel like giving God the glory. And I'll give you my own testimony. I don't remember when I have ever prayed for money. I never prayed for money. I never prayed for a house. I never prayed for a car. I never prayed for anything material. And I got more than most. Because I don't insult God. I feel like shouting in here. I need you to pray that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. Because I got too many saints who don't know what they have. And have not made the proper assessment of what's significant and what is not. My soul, in relationship to God, is the best food, house, car, clothes I could ever have. Because what God is saying is I'll put you in a position where you understand where your peace comes from. You think your peace comes from what you got on your back. And I want to tell you, you're seeking to put it on your back, but it can't do nothing for your spirit. I don't know, I don't need you to go after something that's going to perish. Labor not for the thing that perishes. That ain't where I want you to put your energy. I want you to put your energy in me. And come to get close to me. Close to me if you're naked. Can I talk about God for just a minute? And in, 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 in oh Lord. Somebody said, take your time. So I looked at the time and I said, oh Lord. <laughs> Much of, and I think the influencers have been deceived. I want to do a little, a podcast when I look at America today. And remind me where I started just in case I don't get, you know, I'm at the age now where I got to be. You know? And when you look at America today, 
And if you don't feel the undertone rumblings of where we're going, and all of it began with believing a lie. And America has now, over the last seven, eight years, have become adjusted to believing lies. But lies don't come from the bottom up. Lies come from the top down. So I want to deal with a podcast that talks about when influencers are deceived. How masses become slaves to lies. And God said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send a strong delusion because they have no love for the truth. It is the influences that have changed the church's understanding of God to material wealth. It's the influencers. Those of us who have a voice that people listen to. I have a, I have a friend and he might throw out a nugget of truth. Say something, you know, we talk Bible all the time. You'd get sick of us because that's all we do. And he throws something out, and then, man, I said, Prophet, I think you got it. Uh, oh, man, I can't get no amen. Now, now, if the Bishop Jakes had said that, y'all would be running and falling out. Uh, see, uh, oh, he, see, he got a revelation. And I said to him the other day, I said, you have just, smoked, you've just spoken to my point. And that is, the people who have three or four people following them. And you know you're in trouble. You've been preaching four, five, six, seven, eight years. And when you look at the likes, you only got two. Uh, you ought to try something else. Go, go, go into some other kind of bed. Uh, who, who, who are you talking to? You posting every week and all I see is two and three people. Ain't nobody listening to you. The thing is, when you, got, when you have people with two million followers, why are they following them? Because it's something they have that they're listening to. And the voice that is closest to the truth is not being heard because it's not exciting. Because it's not endearing, it is not drawing, it is not magnetic. So when the influencers are deceived, like Jim Jones, don't look at me like Alice in Wonderland, apostolic folk, apostolic folk were in the crowd that took the cyanide. influencers have got us believing that a relationship with God is material. And you all have begun to measure us by what we drove up in. The label in our clothes. The house we live in or the neighborhood. And it has taken us away from what we should be praying about. As opposed to what we are praying for. 
Uh, can, can, I, can I talk to you a little bit? This is a little bit. My time is up, but just a little bit. I want to point out to something. The prodigal son in his ignorance, in his immaturity, says to his father, give me. And his only prayer was, give me. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And Father, in the name of Jesus, give me, Lord, give me, give me a new job. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give my child. Oh, Lord, you know my child need a scholarship. Give me, give me, you know my child need a new car. Give me, give me, we need a new house. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. But after he bent down to the hog pen, and he was trying to get back home, he no longer was talking about give me. He kept on saying make me. Make me. Make me. Make me. Satan can take from you what you have been given. But he can't take from you what you have been made. Oh I feel like shouting here. I am who I am in a Rolls Royce. I am who I am on a bicycle. I am who I am in a thousand dollar suit. I am who I am in nothing at all. Because once you have been made by God, you cannot be unmade by the devil. What kind of person do you want to be? I want to be nice. I want to be hospitable. I want to be loving. I want to be forgiving. I want to be friendly. I want to be a help. I want to be a giver. I want to be, that's what I want to be. Stop praying about what you want to have and start praying about what you want to be. And I feel like giving God some glory. Give somebody a high five. Say, neighbor, there is power in prayer. You come in here tore up, come in here on drugs, come in here messed up, broken in every way. But when you call on the Lord to make me, make me Lord, make me like Jesus, make me, make me anointed, make me. Make me a son of your glory. I need you to make me somebody that people can depend on. Make me somebody that can walk in and tell the devil how to get out. Get out of my house. Make me somebody that demons will tremble when I walk in the room. I might be in a broken down car. I might pull up in a dirty suit, but I have the power, the power of the anointing in my life. I don't want you to see my car. I don't want you to see my house. I don't want you to see my clothes. I don't want you to see my shoes, but I want you to see Jesus. Show me your house. Show me who's in your house. Don't show me your car. Show me who's driving you. Don't show me your clothes. Show me who clothes you in righteousness. Somebody holler, Jesus. who I'm after Jesus that's who I want to be with Jesus 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 Lord
that'll change the face of the church. I had a thought. It is in challenges that we reevaluate and reassess. And this year, we didn't know we would be moving into different places. But we waited for the right place. And I promise you, we have. By the grace of God, choir, the right place. But our theme was new direction, same Jesus. And things haven't stopped shaking up. Still got some more shaking up to do. But through the power of the Holy Ghost and the direction of the Spirit of God and the Word of God. We're going to change the face of the church. And changing the face of the church isn't always changing the building. It's changing the faces we look at who claim to be representing Jesus. change the access that the unsaved has to the things of God because God his word and his system has never been prohibitive it's the people who have ministered it who have been the ones who keep people from the things of God The disciples were some of the greatest hindrances and Jesus didn't get rid of them because he was going to change all of them to be what he wanted them to be. You're in this building and you're not born again. I want to introduce you to Jesus. I am working on a paper, this, a very serious paper, because I'm going to not publish it, but I'm going to take it directly to the group that I know who needs it. But let me say no, believe is a better word. And I've discovered that, and I'm asking the question, who is the center of your church? Are we using Jesus to bring people to us? Or is he using us to bring people to him? It's a totally different approach. And if you're in this building and you're not born again, the Lord is using us to bring you to him. I don't care where you were last night, I don't care how rough it is. I'm not turning the homosexual away and say you can't come. Come on. I'm not turning the prostitute away and say you can't come. Come on. I'm not turning the addict away, the alcoholic away. I'm saying come. She made me whole. Jesus, Jesus, yes, it is Jesus. Come on, he's calling. 